Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Elder. I'm the chair of the History Project's Board of Directors, and I'll be your host tonight. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us for this talk uh, titled Queerness and Gothic Literature. For those of you who are familiar with us, the History Project is a volunteer-driven community archives dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing Boston's LGBTQ plus history. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has made a contribution to support our work. You can always make a donation on our website. Big or small, these help us share uh, Boston's queer history with the world. I'll drop a link in the chat in a bit. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you all to our digital Ar out of the archive series. Before we get started, I wanna mention a few upcoming events. On Wednesday, November 8th and, and Wednesday, November 29th, we're hosting events as part of a series about the history and impact of gay community news. Founded in 1973 by a small group of lesbians and gay men, this Boston-based community-driven newspaper grew to have an international readership until it ceased publication in the 1990s. On Thursday, November 30th, we're also hosting a virtual talk with author Lucas uh, Hildebrand based on his recently published book, The Bars Are Ours, Histories and Cultures of Gay Bars in America. His talk is titled, Somewhere There's a Place for Us, Urban, Urban Renewal, Gentrification, and Class Conflicts in Boston. You can learn more, more in RSVP for these events and other events on our website at historyproject.org. And please be sure to follow us on social media to learn more about upcoming events and activities. So. Now that's out, that's out of the way, um, uh, let's move on to tonight's talk, Queerness and Gothic Literature, with our guest, uh, uh, Megan Michael. So Megan has worked for the National Park Service for 10 years, with a primary focus on researching and interpreting LGBTQ plus history. She's currently a park ranger at the National Parks of Boston, and has previously worked at Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site, um, Appomattox, Courthouse National Park, um, National Historical Park in Gettysburg National Military Park. She is currently working on her bachelor's degree in public history and literature. Please join me in welcoming Megan. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to get to talk about two of my favorite subjects. Um, so what we're really going to be focusing on tonight is going to be sort of a very brief overview of queer Gothic literature. And I really tried to cover everything. And then I realized it would be like a three hour talk. So unfortunately I am going to have to make it very specifically a certain era. Um, so tonight specifically, we are really mostly gonna be focusing on the origins of queer Gothic literature up until the mid 19th century. Uh, like I said, I tried to push beyond it and my PowerPoint was getting to be like 50 slides and I don't think anyone wants to sit through all of that in one go. Um, so with that in mind, let me share my screen. And then we can jump right into it. All right. All right. So can everybody see the screen right now? Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're really going to be focusing on the first hundred years or so, just because there's so much there. Um, so to really dive into it, we kind of have to dive into both what is gothic and sort of what are the parameters as far as queer gothic goes um so just kind of getting into more the literary side of things uh the gothic is a subcategory of romantic literature um specifically designed to be dark transgressive handles a lot of very taboo subjects um pretty basic content warning for this talk. There are going to be references to a lot of the themes of the Gothic. Um, and some of those common motifs are things like desolate landscapes, ancient buildings, castles, dungeons, um, devils, ghosts, um, especially for British Gothic, there is going to be a lot of anti-Catholicism in Gothic literature, um, a lot of murder, a lot of helpless damsels, um, and a lot of cultural taboos as well, um, common things that do come up time and time again in a lot of early Gothic works are incestuous relationships, sexual assaults, um, they play with ideas of insanity, so it's not 
a subject of literature that I think would appeal to everyone. Um, but it is a very interesting subject as far as literature goes. And especially when it comes to sort of European Gothic and British Gothic, it's often set in the Middle Ages and generally along the Mediterranean, Spain, Italy, and Greece especially. And this really provided British readers with a safe emotional distance. Um, they could read about these taboo subjects, but didn't necessarily have to feel closely connected to it. Um, the other thing, though, is that a lot of the themes of these stories really do play on the fears and anxieties of the times that they were written. Um, death was constant in the 18th and 19th centuries. So anxieties about death and disease, anxieties about other cultures and other races. Um, there's a lot of themes about women's empowerment and how terrifying that is. And a lot of anxieties about outsiders, including queer outsiders. So that does lead us into sort of the specific queer gothic lens of this. And one thing to just kind of set aside as just kind of a basic housekeeping thing is that in the 18th and 19th century, there really were no terms to describe sexuality the way we have them today. And there was no set community the way we have it today. Um, so generally, historians like to use the word queer as sort of an umbrella term. Um, some people were very explicit about their attractions and their loves, but others left it a lot more ambiguous. And so we don't know for sure how they would have identified. So queer becomes a very useful term just overall when we can't say for sure exactly where they would have fallen sort of on the LGBTQ plus spectrum. Um, so with that in mind, the era that we're specifically talking about was not a good time to be queer in any sense of the word. And in fact, in the two countries we're really focusing on, England and the United States, it was a capital punishment. It was something that if you were tried and you were sentenced for sodomy and homosexual acts, the punishment was the death penalty. You would be executed. And that was the case in Massachusetts until 1805. And it was the case in England until 1861. So when we discuss these authors, when we discuss sort of the queer themes of these books, it's important to remember the era that we're discussing was a very dangerous one for these people, um, but it still was something that existed in this time period. Molly houses, gay pubs were things that did exist. And as my research diving in has shown, there were actually more gay pubs and clubs in the 1700s than there were in the 1950s. So even though it was very illegal, it still was something that definitely existed. Um, so because of this, though, a lot of the people we're discussing would have been deeply closeted. And so when they're writing these gothic stories, the stories themselves were often used to reflect both their desires and their repressions as well. Um, and that's really what we're going to get into as far as that goes. Um, so with that, the other thing to point out with queer Gothic literature is that Gothic in general is a somewhat conservative movement. Um, in the vast majority of Gothic stories, especially from this time period, the monster is always defeated. The villain always is destroyed. And most others in this story can then return to, you know, the normal status quo of society. And because of that, queerness does leave a very complex legacy. Um, 
both historically then and today, when you read these stories, you can find yourself in the themes and the characters and can embrace yourself in these works. But the works themselves can often be very homophobic. Um, and that's a very important thing to recognize as well, because queerness in these stories represents both anxiety and desire. But even though the monster and the villain and the evil is always destroyed for the most part, they're also fetishized and they're also eroticized. And so there is sort of an allure to these characters, even when in the end they are destroyed. So with sort of that very brief overview on what all of this is, we can now dive into some of the authors that really shaped this movement to begin with. Um, so here's just a list of some Gothic novels very early on um, hey, wanna... that really made a big impact. Hey, um, Megan, the I first just want to interrupt one... you for a second. We're not... Your screen oh, yeah, is still on the first slide. Oh, no. Let me... see did that work um you're on the the british gothic um oh, oh you're on you are on the first slide now so you could click over to advance to the where yeah now it's working okay so do we see all these slides now <laughs> yes Apologies for that. I got booted. <laughs> All right. Let me try that again. All right. Are we good to go now? Yes. Okay. So sorry about that. Um, oh. Okay, so here's what I was trying to show just in general. Um, so here is what I was referencing. Um, so here's a list of some Gothic stories that were written in this early time period um, that did have a major impact on the literary genre in general. Um, but what we're really going to focus on are the specifically queer ones, uh, which is not to say that these ones aren't. It's just that I haven't done enough digging in to see what the nature of all of these ones are. So really beginning, um, we're going to be starting with Horace Walpole, um, who is really considered to be the creator of the gothic literary movement. Um, his famous work of this genre was Castle of Otranto. It's considered to be the first gothic novel. And he's really the one who created a lot of these tropes that we talk about when we think of gothic. The castles, the sort of isolation. Um, and Castle of Otranto is a very weird story um the inciting incident is that a prince is literally crushed by a giant helmet and everything gets worse from there so weird story but really does create sort of the foundation of the literature as we know it um and as far as Walpole himself goes, there is a lot of evidence that he was a queer man. Um, historically, people thought that he was most likely gay. Um, recently, historians think that he might have been asexual or somewhere along that spectrum, which is, again, why we tend to use queer as sort of an overall umbrella term. Um, but what we do know is that even though he himself was never implicated um, 
and considered to be, you know, a sodomite by the society of the time. He was known to be very effeminate, to have same-sex attractions, um, and his social circle was a very queer one as well. Uh, one of his best friends was Sir Horace Mann, who was a known sodomite at that time. Um, the big thing, though, is... If you were wealthy, you had a bit more of an ability to evade the punishment of the law. Um, so a lot of well-to-do people were able to kind of avoid being arrested. People sometimes would flee England. Um, but his two best friends were Horace Mann, who we know to have been some form of queer, and Mary Berry, who we know very much to have had relationships with women. Um, so Horace Walpole is really kind of the origins of this literary movement, which then leads us into sort of the continuation of that with someone who has a much more complicated legacy, which is William Beckford. And William Beckford his most famous work is Bothek, which is another interesting story. It's all about a Faustian bargain where a man sells his soul and engages in witchcraft and the supernatural to gain political power. Um, this story has human sacrifice. There's a lot of Orientalism to this, which was another popular theme at the time. Um, Definitely, as far as Gothic goes, one of the more problematic ones to just to begin with. And then his personal life wasn't any better. Um, he was considered to be the wealthiest commoner in London, let alone potentially the wealthiest commoner in England. And all of that came from his family's ties to the transatlantic slave trade. His family owned a very large plantation in Jamaica where they enslaved over 3,000 people. So not a great person to begin with, but whether people are good, people are bad, people are somewhere in the middle, it is all part of this history. And even though a person's queer, doesn't necessarily mean that they're a great person. Um, so I did feel it was important to kind of include him in this as well. Um, but to continue that even more, Beckford was known to have affairs with both men and women, most infamously with a boy named William Courtney or Courtney. Um, and they began that relationship when Courtney was about 10 or 11 and Beckford was 18. And this relationship lasted for years. When Courtney's father found out about it and exposed the both of them, they both fled England. Um, Beckford fled to the continent and kind of laid low for a while. And Courtney fled to the United States. Um, one interesting, better aspect of him was the fact that it is likely that he was either the sole author or one of the authors of a poem called Don Leon, um, which really stands out because it's an epic poem that argued against criminalization of homosexuality and advocated for understanding and acceptance. So very trailblazing poem for the time, but written by someone with a much more complicated history to it. Um, so that's really sort of the origins of Beckford himself. The next author and story that does make a major impact on the Gothic is Matthew Gregory Lewis and his Gothic story, The Monk. And as controversial as the Gothic is in general, this one was especially controversial for the time. It was scandalous. People were obsessed with reading this story, but it wasn't something that you were really supposed to be reading. Um, the 
debate as to sort of Lewis's own sexuality is still ongoing. There's just not really enough conclusive evidence either way as to whether he himself was queer or not. But I wanted to include him because the monk in general is a very explicitly queer book. Um, it had depictions of cross-dressing, gender fluidity. Um, there were male-male same-sex relationships on top of all of the other gothic tropes involved. Um, the main relationship really throughout a part of this story is between the main character, the monk himself, Ambrosio, and a demon that he initially meets as Rosario, who then transitions into Matilda, and he doesn't find out until the end of the novel that Rosario slash Matilda is a demon working for Satan to try to get him to sell his soul. So the monk has a very complicated plot. That is just one tiny part of it. Um, but the relationship between these two characters is really the main catalyst that sets everything else in the story onto its very dramatic conclusions. Um, so very important piece of queer literature very early on. But the most important definitely comes from figures that I think we remember a lot better today. And that is going to be the adventures of Mary Shelley and her very eccentric friend group. So this really begins in 1816. Uh, there was a volcanic eruption that really disrupted the global weather patterns. And it was so disruptive that it became known as the year without a summer. And it was during this summer that Lord Byron, uh, John Polidori, Percy Shelley, the future Mary Shelley, at this point, Mary Godwin, and her half-sister, Claire, all decided to go to Lake Geneva together um, for what was supposed to be a fun summer vacation. But when they arrived, they were just trapped inside the entire time. Um, it was raining. It was miserable. It was cold. They didn't really have a chance to go out and do much. So because of that... The group did spend most of their time indoors, drinking, doing drugs, mainly laudanum, which is basically a liquid form of opium. Um, they were all sleeping around with each other, and they passed a lot of their time telling ghost stories. And on top of ghost stories, another thing that they were frequently discussing was the modern science of the day, um, which included experiments with electricity and specifically galvanization, which is using electricity to bring people back from the dead. And with these stories and these discussions, Lord Byron got the idea to write ghost stories of their own to kind of share with the group. But what's interesting is that the two famous poets in this group, Byron and Shelley, gave up on this project very early on. Um, Shelley tried to write a story, but it didn't really go anywhere. Um, Byron began writing a story kind of based on the idea of vampires, but that didn't really go far either. Um, so it was Polidori who was Byron's personal physician, companion, and Mary, who were the ones who actually succeeded in this challenge. And what's really great about this is these two figures would invent two different types of literature in the process. So Polidori, his most famous work, and the story that ultimately came from this vacation was The Vampire. And The Vampire is considered to be the first modern vampire story uh, following the adventures of Lord Ruthven and his companion Aubrey as they set off on a grand tour of Europe together. And 
it plays very heavily on queer euphemisms of the time. There's a lot of allusions to Greek love, a lot of allusions to um, Ruthven himself is described in very queer ways. Aubrey is very much written as someone who is terrified of Ruthven, but also very attracted to him. And unsurprisingly, Ruthven himself was very heavily inspired by Lord Byron himself. And Aubrey seems to have been a bit of a self-insert of Polidori. So Ruthven, unsurprisingly, is secretly a vampire. And that does cause problems for Aubrey later on in the story. I don't want to spoil too much of it. Um, but he is a vampire. And it's a very interesting short story. But what's really interesting about this is that a lot of his fears throughout the story are not that Ruthven is a vampire. Um, for most of the story, the reader doesn't know that he is. So his fears and his anxieties throughout the story read a lot more like he's afraid of his own attraction to him. And so um, as the quote here says, the vampire can easily be read as illustrating a sustained case study in homosexual panic, the hatred and distrust resulting when men suspect themselves or each other of homosexual intentions. But as important as the vampire is, what Mary Shelley writes is infinitely more significant overall because she writes Frankenstein and... I'll get into sort of the queer aspects of the novel itself, but Mary Shelley at this point was Mary Godwin. Um, she was still a teenager at this point, and she is going to go on by writing this story to invent a whole new genre of literature. She's basically the inventor of science fiction, but Mary Shelley is also part of a very queer social circle. Um, in the aftermath of this, a few years later, Percy Shelley is going to die tragically young. He is going to drown in a storm. And Mary was devastated by this. But it does seem, based on her writings at the time, that after his death, she was open to relationships with women, although ultimately she did swear off them altogether, just out of the sheer amount of loss that she did experience in her life. Um, in a letter that she wrote to one of her friends back in the 1830s, um, kind of reflecting on all of this, she wrote, had I been a man, I should certainly have fallen in love with her. As a woman, 10 years ago, I should have been spellbound, and had she taken the trouble, she might have wound me round her finger. 10 years ago, I was so ready to give myself away, and being afraid of men, I was apt to get tousy mousy for women. Experience and suffering have altered all that. I am more wrapped up in myself, my own feelings, disasters, and prospects for Percy. I am now proof, as Hamlet says, both against man and women. And Tousy Mousy is a very weird term, um, one that is not used anymore and probably hasn't been for over a hundred years. Uh, but what Tousy Mousy is, is a euphemism for female genitalia. And she is alluding to a lot more than just wanting a relationship this is actually a very sexual confession that she is making with this um but ultimately it seems like she just kind of swore off relationships altogether in the end but she was still part of a queer social circle um that summer in Lake Geneva. She was obviously in the circle of Lord Byron. Her own husband, Percy, seemed to have been somewhere on the queer spectrum as well. And later on, after Percy's death, um, 
Two of Mary Shelley's friends would be Isabel Robinson and Mary Diana Dodds. And Mary actually procured fake passports for them so the two of them could flee par to Paris and live there disguised as man and wife. So whether Mary was queer, and it seems to be, it, if nothing else, she was very supportive of her social circle in general. But that does lead us to Frankenstein itself, um, which is really a masterpiece of Gothic literature in general, um, but also really considered, again, to be one of the first science fiction stories. And there are a lot of queer themes throughout this book. Victor, the main character, desires to create a child without heterosexual intercourse. Um, his hatred and fear of his creation has often been viewed as a metaphor for internalized homophobia. Um, his disinterest in his own fiance, the fact that he always refers to her as his child or his sister, um, and his relationships with both Henry Clerval and Robert, Robert Walton um, are all things that historically have been viewed through that queer lens. But in modern times, another important lens to view it through is a transgender lens. And even if that's not necessarily what Mary Shelley herself was thinking when she was writing it, it is a very valid and very important interpretation that we can certainly read it through today. And one person who really expresses the transgender view of this novel is Susan Stryker, who writes, like the monster... I am too often perceived as less than fully human due to the means of my embodiment. Like the monsters as well, my exclusion from human community fuels a deep and abiding rage in me that I, like the monster, direct against the conditions in which I must struggle to exist. So like I said at the beginning, even if the monster is destroyed even if the monster is villainized and in frankenstein the creation really isn't villainized at least not by the narrative though he definitely is by victor himself people still see themselves in these stories and like i said frankenstein is really one of the most important gothic novels in my own opinion that leads us to jump across the pond to America specifically. And there's a bit less to talk about here, um, just because, again, we are trying to constrain it into a century. And American Gothic is very much inspired by British Gothic, um, but it's characterized by anxieties that were specifically important to Americans themselves. So themes of religious fanaticism, racial tensions, fear of the wilderness, the occult, isolation, are all things that you see a lot in American Gothic that you don't always necessarily see in British Gothic. And American Gothic stories are also often set more in contemporary times. And if they're historical, it's very recent history. It's very rarely the Middle Ages, though Edgar Allan Poe will dabble in sort of medieval stories himself. Um, but for authors who were born and raised in New England, a lot of their stories also grapple with the legacy of the Salem Witch Trials. The first American Gothic novel that we think of as the original is V-Land, um, which was written in 1798, and it's all about a haunted house. Uh, so really hitting those tropes from the beginning. Um, other notable authors and works, obviously you have The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and you have literally everything Edgar Allan Poe ever wrote. I'm not really going to focus on Poe in this talk because there's really no evidence as far as I know, as far as Poe is concerned, having a queer relation himself. And I need to dive into his stories more 
because so many of them are gothic um so he's important to gothic literature but not really a focus of this specific talk a person who is going to be a focus of this talk though is going to be nathaniel hawthorne in 1850, a group of authors decided to have a picnic out in the Berkshires, and some of the people who went were Hawthorne himself, another prominent writer named Herman Melville, two important publishers at the time, and Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who is just one of my favorite historical figures, so had to include him in the list. But unfortunately for the party, uh, there was a torrential downpour, the group had to take shelter, and in the hour plus that they were waiting for the rain to stop is when Hawthorne and Melville really got the chance to get to know each other. So Hawthorne is really one of the biggest names when it comes to American Gothic literature. Um he starts publishing as early as the 1830s in Gothic stories and continues far beyond that. And it makes sense that he dabbles in Gothic literature, considering his own family history. Um, his great-great-grandfather, John Hathorne, was one of the magistrates involved in the Salem Witch Trials. He was unrepentant in what he did up until the day he died. And it was a very hard family legacy for Hawthorne. And unsurprisingly, because of this, a lot of his stories take place in the Puritan era. And some of them even take place around the time of the Salem Witch Trials. And a lot of the horror in his stories are all about fanaticism of Puritan religion, it's fear of the wilderness, it's fear of the occult. And one of my favorite Gothic stories of his, which I think is also one of the best examples of distinctly American Gothic, is Young Goodman Brown, um, which is all about a young Puritan man who stumbles upon a witch's Sabbath and realizes that everyone in attendance is his own neighbors. He knows everybody there including his own wife so that's sort of the literature that Hawthorne is working with Melville on the other hand is not really known as a gothic writer um he was much known for his adventures at sea and his sort of travel adventure stories typey in 1846 most famously Moby Dick in 1850. Stories we would not consider to be Gothic literature, but his relationship with Hawthorne would inspire a Gothic story. After the two met, the two of them became inseparable, writing to each other, visiting each other. Melville literally moved to Western Massachusetts just so he could live closer to Hawthorne. Um, both of the men were married. It seems like Hawthorne and his wife, Sophia, it seems like they were a good match. Um, whereas Melville and his wife, Lizzie, did not seem to be a very loving marriage. She put up with a lot being married to Herman Melville. Um, and looking back on the relationship now, it's hard to say for sure how reciprocal the relationship was. Um, when it seemed like things started to intensify, Hawthorne really began to pull away, and most of their correspondence was destroyed, but the little correspondence that remains does make it clear just how deeply in love with him Melville was. And... After their separation, which really seems to have occurred in 1852, both of them publish gothic novels. Uh, Melville publishes Pierre, and Hawthorne publishes The Blythedale Romance. Pierre did not get good reviews, and it is a very strange book, and Interesting as far as Gothic goes in that literally everybody dies 
nobody has a happy ending nobody escapes from it it's a even by gothic standards pierre is a very bleak view of this genre whereas the blydale romance is a bit happier but what i do have here to kind of show sort of the relationship and the effect they have on each other um i do have some quotes either from them or from their works so hawthorne receives a letter from melville in 1851 talking about how your heart beat in my ribs and mine in yours and both in god's whence come you hawthorne by what right do you drink from my flagon of life and when i put it to my lips lo they are yours and not mine and one i especially find interesting is this passage from the blithedale romance where hawthorne writes it seemed to authorize any individual of either sex to fall in love with any other regardless of what elsewhere would be judged suitable and prudent and then finally is the poem that melville wrote about nathaniel hawthorne that wasn't published until after melville himself passed away which included the stanza to have known him to have loved him after aloneness long and then to be estranged in life and neither in the wrong and now for death to set his seal ease me a little ease my song so even today it's hard to fully understand exactly where hawthorne was where on this spectrum he would have been Melville's a lot easier. Um, it is very clear that there was a deep romantic attraction on Melville's side. Um, and for better and for worse, these two men did really influence each other going forward. And that leads us to the final person I wanted to specifically talk about, which is Louisa May Alcott. And Alcott there's a lot of speculation about Alcott, um, both regarding gender and sexuality. Out of everyone we've talked about, Alcott really is best to be placed under a queer umbrella because we will never know for sure exactly what Alcott truly felt. Um, but what we do have is her writings and speeches and quotes that have led some people to believe that Alcott might have been a lesbian, have led others to think that Alcott might have been a trans man or non-binary or something like that. We'll never know for sure, but what we do know is that Alcott definitely did have an aspect of queerness to her and writes about this constantly throughout her life um in one case writing i was born with a boy's nature and always had more sympathy for an interest in them than in girls i have fought my fight with the boy's spirit under my bib and tucker and a boy's wrath when i got floored and then about 24 years later she talked in an interview saying I am more than half persuaded that I am, by some freak of nature, a man's soul put into a woman's body. And then later in that interview, she said, I have been in love in my life with ever so many pretty girls and never once the least little bit with any man. And we know that Alcott actually did prefer to go by Lou. It was something that Alcott's family all referred to her as was Lou or Lewis. And when Alcott took in her sister's children, they referred to her as their father. So again, gender, sexuality, hard to fully say with any certainty, but there's definitely something there. And Alcott was also very interested in the gothic and in the macabre the thing she's most famous for is little woman which is not something you consider to be gothic um 
but she wrote a lot of gothic stories and the most famous one wasn't actually published until 1995 because publishers refused to publish it in the 1860s and that story is called a long fatal love chase which opens with a really great quote um where the main character is basically trying to get out of her very miserable life and she writes in this story that basically she would do anything and be willing to sell her soul to the devil to have one year of freedom and sure enough the devil appears she sells her soul to him and she gets the freedom she desired and the rest of the novel is her trying to find a way out of this Faustian bargain that she had entered into. And it's not very often there's stories of women entering into Faustian bargains. It's usually men. And she's a very strong-willed heroine in this story, which is also very uncommon for the gothic genre. So it's another interesting sort of flipping of the gothic that american gothic tends to do that british gothic doesn't necessarily so with that there's still a lot more to cover um there's so many other stories to discuss um, I didn't even get into Oscar Wilde. I didn't get into Bram Stoker, Henry James, Daphne, Daphne du Maurier. There's a lot there, but I've already been talking for about 50 minutes. And like I said, this only covered 100 years, which is why I decided to kind of break it up. If in the future we want a part two, I would definitely be happy to do it. Um, but it's a good kind of overview of sort of the origins of this genre. And so there's a lot more there to be read. So I really wanted to conclude this with a couple quotes from Guillermo del Toro, um, who, as far as I know, is not queer, but has a really good sensibility of what the Gothic represents. And I think really speaks to why queer gothic is so important to queer people um, when he talks about how monsters are evangelical creatures for me when i was a kid monsters made me feel that i could fit in somewhere even if it was an imaginary place where the grotesque and the abnormal were celebrated and accepted since childhood i have been faithful to monsters I have been saved and absolved by them because monsters, I believe, are patron saints of our blissful imperfection and they allow and embody the possibility of failing. And I think that's just a really positive view of what historically has been a very negative thing. And I think that's why the queerness is embraced no matter how negative that interpretation might be. So with that in mind, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, that's pretty much all I had to say just right off the bat. So I will stop sharing my screen. If I can figure out how. There we go. Thank you so much, Megan. And um, so if if Folks have questions, they're free to drop in the chat or to raise their hand. I see Deb has your has their hand raised. Deb. Yeah, this is amazing. Thanks for doing this. Um, some of these movies, are any of these, I don't have a lot of time to read, but are they in the movies or is there any way to do like the abridged, the unabridged version of these, some of these? <laughs> um, as far as like their personal lives or the stories themselves? Well, I guess the stories themselves, uh, maybe they're, they're individual lives, since a lot of this probably got pushed, you know, under the rug, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of adaptations of stories, it really depends on the era that they're made. Um, and 
even sort of whether or not the filmmakers lean into sort of the queer coding that the authors necessarily did um there's been so many adaptations of frankenstein um and off the top of my head i don't know if there's any that fully lean into it unfortunately um there's also been a lot of movies made about mary shelley um the one movie that I know that really does lean into the queerness is a movie called Gothic from the 1980s, which from everything I hear about, it is a very, very bad, but very, very camp movie. Um, so I don't know if I recommend it because I haven't actually seen it yet, but I might watch it tonight, actually, because I've been curious. Well, thanks, Megan. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. I also imagine there are quite a few uh, good audiobook versions of these um, books and because they're out of they're out of copyright are probably free um do, are there other questions uh, uh somebody's re recommending the bride of frankenstein um is it anything yes. like the book no absolutely not yes, but so... the entire cast was queer and the subtext is leaping out of the whole time yes i forgot about bride of frankenstein it has nothing to do with the book um it is a sequel to the original 1930s Frankenstein movie, uh, but Theo is absolutely right. It J James Whale was a queer man. Um, the entire cast was gay, bisexual. It is one of the most camp movies I've ever watched in my life. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so yeah, I guess if you're going to watch any Frankenstein media, I would definitely recommend Bride of Frankenstein. people are sharing um suggestions in the chat which is great thank you all um and including a, a librivox which is a great resource for free out of copyright audiobooks um the 1940s adaptation of rebecca um are there other questions that people have feel free to um you know raise your hand unmute yourself or drop something in the chat and there's something deb had also asked was whether you'd be okay sharing a list of the of the titles that you talked about today absolutely um i can definitely what would the best way to do that be if you send them to me and i will figure out the best way to do that i can definitely do that i, I would be Maybe happy put it to. In the, um, when we post this uh recording we can include that in the comments for the in the recording perfect yeah no i'd be happy to Uh, just hopping in with a question. Um, hi, friend. <laughs> Not a question, but hi. Uh, if there were any of the books that you've talked about or books that you've mentioned or uh, gothic books that you haven't didn't mention in this that you would love to see a big screen, you know, budget bigger than God, uh, what would you like to see that adaptation of that leans fully into the queerness? Like, what do you most want to see adapted for a screen? Dracula, <laughs> which unfortunately was not part of this talk because, again, it already was an hour. Um, but Dr Dracula, and I did a talk about this like two years ago, but there's so much queerness in Dracula and I would love to see like a really good accurate film adaptation of it yeah. um just to even get like the relationship between jonathan and mina correct like they're such a good couple and they never do it well so i'm it's a little bit uh, uh, gary oldman doesn't do it for you huh i mean it's the the 1990s dracula movie is fun but i would i just want something that's different <laughs> um oh that's another i see a question about um contemporary audience reactions to the early books um from what i know castle of otranto um was very popular it was definitely like something new um the queer themes were very subtle Walpole was really more leaning into like the other aspects of you know haunted castles and madness and 
unfortunately quite a bit of incest as well as many gothic novels did um I know for a fact that the monk was very controversial um and people were very upset about that book and I believe even then people definitely touched on sort of the gender fluidity of the demon character um but people complained about a lot of things in that book it was very scandalous uh matthew lewis was 19 when he wrote it and it definitely reads like the dark fantasies of a 19 year old boy for sure um and then frankenstein also got mixed reviews um it got really good reviews but it also got really bad ones um but readers loved it so critics aren't always right if critics hated frankenstein because it again i'm biased but i do think it's one of the best books ever written yeah i think we have time for uh one more question nobody has anything I say that um, the question I have you, which you might have given your, given it away. So, as somebody who's always looking for an, a book to read, and would your what would your recommendation be for a, a kind of a first foray into reading about kind of um, gothic queer literature? Is it Frankenstein? So, something else? Yeah, I would say. I would say Frankenstein is definitely of the early books, some of the more readable ones. I would also definitely recommend any of Hawthorne's short stories. Um, I'm definitely in the minority in that I actually do really like Nathaniel Hawthorne's novels, uh, but I know not everybody does. But his short stories are amazing, and I think they're a really good introduction into sort of American Gothic. Um, Dracula is a great Gothic novel. Um, there's so many great things I didn't get the chance to talk about. As far as queer gothic in general, um, a lot of it is online. Um, there haven't been like a lot of specific books written about it. Um, there is this book that I've been referencing called Queer Gothic by George Haggerty. Um, it's more like, what's the word? Like ph philosophical, like it has to do a lot with like philosophy and stuff. So not entry level there was a lot of this book that was going over my head um but i know things like penguin uh publishing company has some articles on queer gothic literature um so definitely online there's a lot to be found for sure well thank you so much megan everybody um join me in thanking uh megan for this great talk um so Thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you uh, want to learn more about um, upcoming History Project events, uh, you can visit um, historyproject.org. Um, and if you'd like to make a donation, you can visit um, historyproject.org slash support. Um, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you, Megan. I'm going to stop recording now.